So good evening, everyone, and welcome to our last event of the conversation series on authority. My name is Alice, and I'm a third year student in the Master of Architecture program at Columbia University. I am originally from Sao Paulo, Brazil, and one of the co-directors of Latin GSAP. Latin GSAP is an interdisciplinary student organization in the Columbia's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation, dedicated to the promotion, discussion, and reflection of contemporary issues and ideas in Latin America. The overarching thing as selected by Latin GSAP for the semester is authority. Authority refers to the acknowledgement of the existence of oneself through the capacity to recognize the other as such, a singular subjective person. Authority is an essential process to achieve empathy, the capacity to put ourselves in someone else's shoes. If we cannot see the other, we cannot respect them, or if we can only see the other as a negation of oneself, we cannot relate. Uh, the semester, this semester, Latin GSEP is working on a variety of projects related to the theme of authority, such as our new publication named Patio. Patio welcomes submissions for all creators with focus on Latin American subjects. We invite you to submit any project, provocation, interview, or imagination that you have created that addresses the theme of authority in Latin American context. For more information and submission guidelines, please check Patio's website and Instagram account. We will be dropping the links in the Zoom chat for those who are interested. Yeah. We will also like to take this opportunity to thank the support of Professor Anna Ditch, who co-created the series with us, as well as the collaboration of GSAP, the Institute for Latin American Studies, Columbia Global Center Rio and Santiago, and many other organizations. So tonight, I'll 30 and the third landscape recapitulates on the accumulation, accumulated knowledge from previous events by centering the conversation on the meaning of authority and its spatial implications. Starting from the alumni conversation in before, during, and after GSAP, the event gathered alumni with a shared identity of being from Latin America in the United States, but bringing different backgrounds, perspectives, and experiences in their field. The second event, Mapping Authorship, invited the guests to address questions of authorship in mapping as an exercise of recognition to define the other, meaning the regulation of visibility or invisibility of the Latin community in Latin America and the United States. The third event, Urban Fabric and Scale, invited emerging practices working in Latin America to dialogue about the synergies and ruptures of the urban space in the design approach. The talk was ingrained in the specificity of their localities, bringing forth the discussion around identity. So tonight, we would like to welcome you and our panelists, Ana Maria Duran Calisto, Renato Simbalista, David Governor, and Gerard Pochi. Tonight's event aims to investigate investigate how authority is represented or acted upon by different groups in Latin America. We will also touch upon how issues of identity and authority are reshaped when we expose the diversity of experiences and imaginaries around Latin America. Without further ado, I would like to introduce today's keynote speaker and moderator, Professor Ana Ditch. Ana is an adjunct associate professor at Columbia GSAP. She's an architect and urban designer who for the past 20 years has worked between Sao Paulo and New York, using design to promote interaction. She is currently leading research on the urbanization of Brazilian Amazon in the project Indigeneity and Urbanization in the Amazon. She's also principal at the design, at the design studio Arc Arquitetura da Convivencia. So I will stop sharing and let Professor Under to take the lead. I'm going to share my screen. Can you see my screen? Perfect. Okay, so thank you everyone for being here. Um, especially thanks for those who are um, in places where it's really late. Um, I'm going to be very brief so we can um, get our guests um, speaking. Um, I'm going to start with this um, phrase from Eliane Brun. Nothing is more authoritarian than to tell someone that they are not what they say they are. 
In, in his article, um, The Origin of the Baré People, Bras França, an elder from the Baré, asks himself what would his great grandfathers say if they could compare their good lives with his destroyed one. They would, he suggests, say they were not Indians. They were Baré de Sana, Baniwa, Hopi, Tucano, Arauete, Guarani, Caiová, Camaiurá, Chavante, Axaninka, Assurini, Yanomami, Tembé, Suruí, Guajajara, and so many others with their own cosmovision and their own language. Today in Latin America, we're still giving names we are, or we are taking them away to a population that is highly plural, creating an illusion of a minority other. That in reality is larger in numbers and fictional in color. This idea of an opposite other seems to be more the fabrication of a dominant voice, in our case, the voice of industrial capitalism, with its dependence on endless cycles of production and consumption, and with a white face. It's a story that started in Europe in the 14th century with the detachment of the power that emanated from land and the transition from a rural embedded world with an agrarian economy to the world of the city and then to that of industry, where the modern imaginary is structured around notions of individual rights, those of life, liberty, and property. In this new imaginary, civility became the token for citizenship an educated politeness, the opposite of the savage, of the uncivilized. As we can see from these terms, the underlying contrast is really between life in the forest and life in the city. Savage comes from the French sauvage, wild, and from the Latin sylvaticus, of the wood. Fast forward six centuries and we all kind of know where we are with our climate, with our economy, with our health and so on. Some of us though have started to be skeptical about it. In 2016, the Washington Post reported on a survey conducted with millennials by Harvard University where 55% of them said they did not support capitalism. In 2018, Vogue Teen, Salon, and Money Watch reported on, a, on the reaction by my millennials to a CNN article. 66% of them said they did not save for retirement because they believed capitalism would not exist by the time they were 65. And you may have seen this also um, in the New York Times this weekend. So as we pivot our perspective to rebalance our concepts of what is rural and what is urban and what it means to be savage and what it means to be civilized, our attention center again in nature, in the forest. And you will hear Ana Maria talk a little bit about this in a minute. We center in those who belong to the forest, those who Ailton Krenaki in his little book entitled Ideas to Postpone the End of the World has ironically called the sub-civilized. The Indians, the blacks, the traditional riverine communities, the Aboriginal, all of those who at the margins have this organic uncivilized, uncivilized layer that has kept them grasped, holding really, really tight to the earth, to a circular culture that has quite a different sense of hierarchy between what is human, what is natural or divine and subjective. 
where the mundane routine elements of life are embedded in a sense of divine importance that correlates and connects people. Nature, things. What David Kopenawa has taught us, the Yanomami called the Shapiri, the spirit of things, of the great machine earth. In this imaginary, objects are transformed into subjects. Everything is person and interchangeable, what Viveiros de Castro has coined as the Ameridian perspectivism. The cosmological calendar is correlated to natural, social, and productive renewable cycles that defy our anxious fragmentation of time to establish modes of production that leverage nature without destroying it. Borders are fluid and territories demarcated by its inherent natural shape as well as its historic cultural use rather than superimposed property lines. And you will hear Davi touch on this in showing his work in the favelas of Venezuela. The marks of this collective individual also add different meanings to the communal use of these spaces. And Renato, although from a different perspective, will talk about notions of common property when he talks um, next. But maybe above all, what all of these communities, these stories, traditions, songs, and resistances show us is an expanded range of possibilities of different narratives different stories that maybe could help us, us the civilized, expand our own subjectiveness to create a new landscape, a third landscape that is global because it's securely anchored in what is very local and is universal because it is multiple. And Jera will talk about this when she explains her experience in Teno de Porã in Sao Paulo. So now I would like to introduce our four guests and speakers whose work and experiences I think are helping to shape what I have called this third landscape. Um, we're going to start with Ana Maria Calisto. Um, we're going to then talk um, here Renato and then Davi and then Jera. Ana Maria is an Ecuadorian architect and urban environmental planner. She received doctors at the urban planning department of UCLA on the history of urbanization in the Amazon basin with a focus on the oil urbanisms of Ecuador. Currently, she is visiting faculty at Yale University. Duran Calisto co-founded the design firm Studio A0 with her husband and partner, Jaskram Jas Kalirai in Quito in 2002. And Studio A0 advocates for social environmentally responsible design and construction in urban, rural, rural and forested contexts. And you will hear her, she's extremely intelligent, eloquent woman who I secretly hope one day will run for office and help us with all of this third landscape thing. Renato Simbalista is a very, very good friend, but he's also an associate professor at the University of Sao Paulo and Uninovi. He is one of the founders of FICA, a collectively owned real estate fund in Sao Paulo that protects land from speculation. And he is also the president of Instituto Polis, a civil organization that aims for the construction of just, sustainable, democratic cities. And then we have Davi Gouverneur, who has the most beautiful drawings I hope he shows us today. He's an associate professor of practice at the University of Pennsylvania and professor emeritus of Universidad Rafael Urdaneta in Venezuela. Among other things, his professional practice focuses on urban plans and projects for the rehabilitation of, of areas affected by extraordinary natural events the improvement of existing formal settlements and planning ahead for emergent informal occupation. 
as well as the rehabilitation of cultural landscapes. His current area of research focuses on the notion of informal amateurs, which culminates in his book called Planning and Design for Future Informal Settlements, Shaping the Self-Constructed City. And then finally, we're going to hear Jera, Jera Poti, is one of the incredible Guarani Mimbia young leaders who fought for the legal recognition of the territory Tenondepura in the Atlantic forest in the outskirts of the city of Sao Paulo in Brazil. And in 2014 were, was granted the first legal step toward its legalization. Since then, she has guided her community in the occupation of the new land and through agroforestation, a very beautiful um, work of agroforestation. She is managing the forest to its original environmentally balanced state. She has collected and successfully planted traditional Guarani seeds and has more than 30 types of sweet potatoes, as well as eight types of Guarani corn. So I would like to introduce now um, Anna. Uh, do you want to share images? Thank you, Professor. De nada. Thank you, Anna, for that amazing introduction. I mean, it was an incredible lecture in and of itself. Beautiful. I'm going to share my screen. Um, okay, can you see it now? Here we wait. Could it be seen now? Yes, we can, we can see. Okay, it's a bit slow, the computer, but now it's starting. Okay, so um, I've been thinking a lot about in terms of this word alter, which refers to others, about the title of the book, The Ecologies of Others, that some of you may have uh, read. It's one of the books by the anthropologist Philippe Descola, who's, who's been lots of his time in the Amazon and, and also specifically in the Ecuadorian Amazon with the Achuar and the Shuar people. And I think it's an incredible, in, incredibly interesting statement. Two of the titles of his books, and of course his books are amazing, but the titles just have glued to my brain. One of them is The Ecologies of Others, which I think is, is an interesting way of introducing the topic today in a more general fashion. And the other one is a book he has, I read it in Spanish, it's titled La Selva Culta, which some of you may have read as well. And it totally refers to the critique that Anna was launching in terms of precisely reversing the prejudices and the notions that we have about the savages of Amazonia as I so often in colonial viewpoints it used to describe incredibly civilized peoples. And that's what he's trying to reverse by calling the book La Selva Culta, it was published in the late 80s or early 90s, I believe. And when I was young, it deeply marked me in terms of how I viewed Amazonia, which was actually introduced to me, believe it or not, not in Ecuador, but in Brazil, because the first Amazonian city that I ever visited was Manaus. And Manaus left a very deep mark in me when I was 14 or 15 years old, and I was completely shocked by these ginormous city um, nestled in the middle of, uh, of Amazonia. But just in terms of the, the provocation that you have put on the table for us tonight in terms of what does alterity mean and, and thinking about words that we associate with the notion of alter, a, both as noun and as verb alteration, but also alternative to alter, to change, to, to transform, and uh, in terms of time, also alternate, go back and forth. And of course, we associate it with the alter ego, which has to do even with the otherness within our own selves. And uh, in Spanish, you know, we speak of the otredad, which has been an important notion in Latin America precisely because of these, um, this encounter that marked us in the, at the end of the 15th century, but continues to mark us today. And then if I put that provocation together with the other one, the notion of the third landscape and how this otherness is manifested in the territory, um, I feel that in Latin America, this 
these third landscapes or these altered landscapes, and this can go both in you know a very positive or a very negative direction, but that it also has to do with the notion of the landscape of others and with the culture of others. Mm -hmm. And this notion of alterity doesn't belong just to the West and to the, the colonial uh, pursuit of the West in Latin America, uh, of which we all descend as mestizos, but it's, it's, an, it's a concept that is embedded in all cultures. For example, the Waurani call us the Kowode. The Kowode are the non Wauranis, you know, and it's interesting for me to see that in every single Amazonian language, there's a notion to name those who do not belong to the community, who do not belong to this specific culture or civilization. So, so that's something that I feel we need to keep in mind in terms of the notion of otherness. And also the fact that when these two ontologies clashed in the 16th century during the conquest, that, that the idea of the other was handled and conceptualized in a very different way from the perspective of, of the original peoples of the Americas that as Anna pointed out, are very hard to name because all words that we use are very colonial and have a deep, uh, complicated history. The words like indigenous, Amerindian, what have you. And on the other hand, the Europeans that we, were arriving into this continent. And, um, um, there, you know, these, these ontological clash emerged and uh, there was a huge shift in the Americas from a culture that is deeply spiritual and that saw the coming of Europeans as almost like the coming of some of the spirits in their cosmologies, like Viracocha in the case of the Andes, but in Mesoamerica there was an, analog an analogous God that was being expected. Whereas from the perspective of Europe, it was exactly the opposite. Beings coming into the Americas were seen almost as, you know, as spiritual, almost as divine in a way. But the Europeans reacted in exactly the opposite direction. They were discussing in Spain whether the people that they ha had encountered in the Americas have a soul or not. Um, so it was the opposite, you know? And within that ontology, there was some sort of a bestialization. That's a tough one in English. But you know, um, this is not a culture that has a relationship with other organisms that is horizontal and about interdependencies and interrelations like the quote unquote Amerindian cosmo cosmovision. This is a culture where there's a pyramid in terms of the understanding of life and animals are below human and everything, you know, and plants are below animals and even below them uh, minerals. So these are two very different ontologies coming together in one territory, in one series of incredibly diverse ecologies and landscapes and, and cultures. And what we see today is simply the outcome of this first encounter that substituted a market system that was very different in the pre-Columbian period which was based on reciprocity um, with a market that was very asymmetrical and that was based on exploitation. And this market that was inaugurated in the 16th century, century when modernity is born is a market that has simply accelerated and become intensified. But the logic is, uh, is the logic that was inaugurated when the Americas were encountered by the Europeans. And whether, you know, talking about the alterations and the altered landscapes in Latin America, we cannot cease to be shocked even in our lifetime. I mean, this picture is from the early 70s. I was born in 1971. So I have seen the alteration of these landscapes in this last peak of capitalism and modernization, which uh, I think was still a little bit more benign back in the 70s, in the 90s, it went out of control. And whether they're landscapes of extraction, that is a formal type of extraction, like in the case of these open mine pit, or an informal type of extraction, like in the case of these um, gold mining area in Brazil, you see very similar patterns in Peru, in Colombia, in Ecuador. And the, the other side of this alterity within the urban uh, landscapes, I was thinking, looks like this in Latin America. Again, you have this notion of alterity, of the orders of 
the formal order, quote unquote, and the informal order, quote unquote, the order of those who manage to benefit from this political and economic system and the ones that are, you know, referred to as the surplus humanity by Davis, which are all the people that are left out, which in Latin America, in our cities, we're talking about between 30 to 80% of the population. So we're not discussing minorities here. We're definitely, definitely discussing majorities. Majorities that are definitely not benefiting from the way in which our economic models are working right now based on, on extractiv extractivism and, and the primary economy. And um, in the Amazon specifically, 80% of urbanization is of this nature. It's self-built, it's entropic, it is not part, but simply an, a negative externality, an outcome of the global capitalist system. And of course, what do you have in the opposite pole of this informality, standardization, modernization, quote unquote development, quote unquote a progress. This is the one of the projects for Miña Casa, Miña Vida in, in Manaus. And it's precisely the opposite impulse of homogenizing of turning everybody into an equal, but in the face of a very specific culture. There's a very Eurocentric um, stance uh, underneath this, uh, this modernization process. But of course, what's happening in Latin America, you have the type of practice that you already engaged in one of your panels. You have a new generation that is looking at the vernacular, at that otherness that has been systematically excluded as poor, as undesirable, and retrieving these values. And this is happening at all scales. And the scale that I'm looking at specifically in Amazonia, and I don't have time to go, unfortunately, deep into these, but there's a lot of accruing evidence that is demonstrating that Amazonia was a highly, quote unquote, urbanized area. And why, why am I using, quote unquote? Because these were not cities in the Mesopotamian. These were not cities in the Greco-Roman sense, in terms of walled cells surrounded by countries, surrounded by a rural area, very dual, and then surrounded by a, a hinterland or a forest. These were agroecological systems in which agroecology is completely intertwined with habitat management and with clusters of settlement systems that have dif um, differential hierarchies. In Amazonia, they were pretty heterarchical. But what archaeologists are demonstrating today, and this is going to be a leap of faith because I don't have time to show you all the evidence, is that the planning system that was born in the Amazon in terms of these cl clusters of population embedded in a highly anthropogenic agroecological landscape that includes the domestication and the management of forests, this system is the one that, that migrated to the Andes, you know, through the tributaries like the Ucayali or the Madeira or the Napo, and the system that migrated up to the north through the Orinoco, the Caciquiare, the Orinoco into the Carib Caribbean, the Arawaks were amazing um, sailors, and you know, all the way into Central America and eventually Mesoamerica, because the principles of design are very similar. The forms vary immensely. I'm not trying to essentialize here. The diversity, the cultural diversity that the Americas displayed in the 16th century is beyond description, not just linguistically, but also from the perspective of urban form. I'm talking about the underlying principles that could be described as some sort of, again, the problems with language as an Amerindian ontology of the city, which in contemporary terms could be fairly described as an agroecological urbanism. And these are the underlying principles that you find uh, in the Waka systems of Lima, that you find in Tiwanaco in Bolivia, that you find in the Mayan system of the Altepetels, or the Nahua system, I'm sorry, the Nahua system of the Altepetels, or the Maya system of the Cas, or the Mixtec system of the news. And it's fascinating to see that Elements like what are what is called the Waru Waru in the Peruvian Andes or Chinampas in Mexico, 
or camellones in some other places, in principle, whether they're in the Beni or in Quito or in Mexico City or in the Paraná, they are, they are similar. They're you know, principles that have to do with engaging na nature in a way that potentializes it. So these, you know, the peoples in the Americas were incredible landscape builders. But taking into account the fact that they were very spiritual cultures, I think that rather than speaking in terms of geo, just terraformers or geoformers, we would have to say that they were doing geopoetics, biopoetics, ecopoetics, because landscapes uh, were sacred. And um, this is a book that has deeply marked me in terms of helping me to understand that city and territory are inseparable in the Americas, to, to build in the ancient Americas, to build cities, to build territory. And Jose Canciano Amico has done a superb job at drawing how natural landscapes were transformed into productive landscapes that now we confuse for nature. So we talk about Amazonia from a naturalist perspective and we forget that it was highly anthropogenic. We talk about uh, the Andean landscapes also, uh, often forgetting that they're highly an anthropogenic. The cocha systems in the Andes that we see right now, and we think, wow, what a beautiful landscape. They're actually, uh, to a large extent, built by the Andean peoples. And they used amazing strategies to build the landscape. This is the cocha system, for example. We see them everywhere in the Andes. Well, these were excavated to reach the phreatic level of the water, to bring the water up. And then it has all the carrizos around it, the totora and these mounds. It's completely artificial, but it looks very natural to us. And ultimately the point that Canciani Amico is trying to make, and I couldn't agree more with him and with lots of other architects and archeologists and, and historians that are looking at the pre-Columbian period is that in the Americas, the city is the pinnacle of a territory of a whole transformation of the territory that supports each cluster within a territorial constellation or series of clusters whose, whose underlying understanding, I wouldn't want to call it geometry because that's too formal and too rigid, whose understanding, underlying understanding of urbanity as a territorial constellation is ultimately a Amazonian. So, you know, suddenly this quote unquote, savage space, the more you study it, the more you realize that is a highly civilized space that has given us one of the most brilliant planning systems in the world that everybody overlooks because everything indigenous is supposed to be backward, frozen in time, undeveloped, unprogressive, et cetera, et cetera. And I just want to call by, I just want to wrap up by sharing with you a, a concept that a, a Quechua friend in Quito shared with me that the Quechua's use a lot, Quechua's in Peru, Quechua's in Ecuador, which is the concept of the ñaupa. And it's another concept that is, you know, appears with different words in many cultures in the Americas, which is the idea in a way of ñaupa is used to refer to past events as much as it is used to refer to future events. So I always think when I feel like overwhelmed and impotent in the face of what's happening in Amazonia specifically, I think about Ñaupa because I think, okay, Sacha, forest, Sacha Ñaupa, the rebirth of the forest. So I think, okay, that forest that was built by these incredible human beings who've died by the millions due to epidemics like the one we are experiencing today, not just in the 16th and 17th centuries, Every single time we penetrate the forest, whether it's missionaries or soldiers or colonos or land grabbers, what have you, native Amazonians die off and die off and die off. It's been a perpetual genocide in terms of pandemics. And every time I, you know, I feel like impotent, I think, okay, such a ñaupa. The, the forest and its peoples will be reborn. Because at this point in climate change history, there's no other way out. If Amazonia falls, we fall with it, have no doubt. And Amazonia is falling. And a Brazilian scientist that, whom I spoke with the other day, whose name unfortunately I can't remember, told me something that remained vividly in my mind when we were discussing climate change and Amazonia. He said, it's very easy for us to imagine a melting glacier. It's tangible. 
we can see it. We can see the iceberg, the glacier melting. Amazonia is exactly the same. Imagine that if we reach a certain temperature, Amazonia will melt down, whether we burn it or not, it doesn't matter. Beyond a certain temperature and a certain point, Amazonia will become a savanna, which is also the argument of Carlos Nobre. But to think of it in terms of the analogy with an iceberg was really shocking to me. It's irreversible. It's one of those, you know, um, phenomenons that we're going to have to deal with. But with that, I'm closing. And sorry if I took, I don't even know what time it is. Oh, no so I'm going to turn my microphone off. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Gracias. Um, Osvaldo, eu queria só perguntar para Gerard se ela está olhando o chat, se ela quer que a gente continue fazendo a tradução. Desculpe, mas não pode ser em espanhol. Acho que o, ela está muted. I'm just trying to see if Gerard wants us to continue translating for her. Gerard, você quer que continue traduzindo no chat ou não? É, o microfone dela não está não tá funcionando. Mudo. Agora. Oi. Não precisa. Eu estou tá. lendo umas coisas também e depois você me coloca a par de tudo. Tá <risos> Porque vai ser muito cansativo também para vocês. Tá bom. Então a gente já te chama. Tá. Eu queria, I would like now to, I'm sorry if everyone, I'm just trying to um, sort out a technical problem with Jeda. Um, I would like to call um, Renato to present his um, to make his talk. Hola a todos. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Anna, and thank you so much uh, for this amazing group for inviting me. Uh, and congratulations for uh, not just the program, but the magazine as well. I am thinking about submitting something to this uh, amazing magazine sometime. Maybe not this uh, edition. Well, it's not that easy to talk about after Ana Maria and while she was talking I was here uh, reframing at the beginning of my talk and I would like to remember Max Weber's um, uh, one of Max Weber's papers when he talks about uh, two different uh, social roles which are the prophets and the priests. Ana had a prophet talk and I'm just about to begin a priest talk about a very small micro specific project an I statement and this is where I'm uh, talking about. I hope uh, you'll be able to adapt your lenses from the macro macro civilizatory and epistemological thing for this like kind of a uh, small activist and also bureaucratic and administrativist uh, talk that I'm about to uh, begin. Let's see if I can share the screen. Yes, we can see. Like many of you, I have a very uh, strong academic background. I am uh, a trained architect, but I've been a professor my whole life and uh, I have been a professor and at the same time an activist until 2011 when I became a full job professor at the University of Sao Paulo, which is a very like brainy uh, kind of university uh, in, in Brazil, a very good university, very important one, but at the same time like a, a universe in itself and it made me quite uh, uncomfortable because after uh, many years of uh, sharing my time between activism and uh, research, uh, academic, academia and so on. Uh, I felt myself very annoyed about some uh, concepts that were circulating in the university and one of them was gentrification. 
everybody in Brazil was talking about gentrification. We were in 2011 in the middle of a very important real estate boom. And uh, everybody was talking that real estate prices were crazy, poor people were not, uh, 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 in some years time, they will not, would, were not able to live in downtown anymore. We would follow the steps of these north uh, uh, metropolises such as New York, London and Paris and so on. And together with some friends, we started to get uh, uncomfortable with this situation of just talking about gentrification and not doing anything about. At the same time, we've thought with that uh, the idea of gentrification was a um, powerful I idea. Of... I hear something. Do you hear me? You can keep going. Okay, yeah. uh, when I, uh, at the same time that gentrification is a very powerful concept for activism in the academia, it started to become like a uh, common sense word and uh, everybody was talking about gentrification, but nobody was thinking about what can we do to address it. I started to get even more uncomfortable when I started to see that some municipalities in cities such as Berlin, uh, Barcelona, and Chicago were addressing gentrification and starting to make public policies uh, devoted to address it or to revert it, or at least to respond and to identify it. And we in the academic realm were not even recognizing these steps. And it's really very complicated when we, with all the time and resources that research give, gives us see ourselves behind even public officers. So that was the starting of a talking with some colleagues, with some friends, some of them inside uh, the university, many of them uh, professionals and activists, some of them students. What can we do to address gentrification? We knew uh, that it had to do with money, it had to do with creating a kind of institution uh, and our response, this was back in 2015, was to create an uh, association, an association which we called back then the Community Property Association, uh, which basically crowdfunds uh, money in order to buy or to hold uh, property that uh, should be bought in the downtown areas and rent at uh, way below prices to the uh, uh, people that can, could not afford houses uh, to buy or to rent houses in an, a decent way in downtown uh, and in, in, in general in the Brazilian metropolis, but it happened to be in Sao Paulo, uh, the project. So it's really simple as a concept. We build an institution that has a tax number. With this tax number, we can buy any property that we want. We can buy, well, any property, the whole city, if the city, if we had the money and if we had uh, someone who would sell the property for us, we are technically able to buy it. And then we started to ask for money in a very micro, micro way. Uh, also, to, uh, so that I share with you a little bit of our situation in Brazil. Brazil has no housing associations that do this already in many countries, such as uh, the Netherlands, that hold property as a kind of a service, not in order to uh, use it as a commodity. Even in America, you have many housing associations or foundations for housing. In Brazil, we have either private market property or public property or specific projects that are devoted to respond these or this uh, question that uh, happen to hold property, but they are not devoted to uh, hold property and to use it in a uh, specific uh, socially progressive way. These other social pro projects that we have many, they have their mission, environment protection and supporting to LGBT communities and so on. And if they hold property, they use the property in order to accomplish their missions. FICA was built as an association that is supposed to hold property and use it in socially progressive ways that can be multiple ways, but its mission is to lock property out of the speculative market. If our institution works well, we hold, we buy property and we hold it forever. We'll never sell it. So until the end, 
of this world, there will be the cockroaches and ficus property. So this is the, this is the ideal model. We'll not be here to check this out, but this is our utopia. The legal form is an association. And I think it's quite interesting with, if you are thinking about the third landscape, uh, this is really something in between uh, private property and public property. Of course, an association is not public property. Technically, this is private property, but it's private property hold by an institution that has in its core mission being collective property, being communal property, using it in socially progressive uh, ways. It has a board of directors and of people who, who look really like me, white, middle class uh, people. We are starting to get a professional team from 2019 on and Bianca Antunes, who is here in the right side of uh, the screen is our uh, general coordination. She's doing an amazing job. And then we started from 2017 on it was quite difficult to register the association when we did it. We started a crowdfunding in a very normal crowdfunding platform in which people can donate every month. And right now we have like 60 associates and Ajuli is one of the, our earlier supporters and she's a member of our international advisory board. So we, th we thank so much for inputs about it. And we have also supporters, which are people that are paying every month so that we exist. It's amazing, but yes, these people exist. <laughs> And it's really simple. People make monthly contributions. You put your credit card numbers and every month there, there will be a, a certain amount of money discounted from your uh, credit card, which can be really as little as 15 reais a month, which is like three espressos in our price. It will be probably one espresso at your price. So if you want to support us, since you are late in the uh, group, be our, our guest. And nowadays, four or five years on, we have uh, around uh, 150 monthly supporters that support us with 7,500 AIs a month, which in US dollars doesn't seem a lot, but in our currency rates is really an achievement. We have uh, uh, 260,000 in your fund. Maybe we can buy two further apartments. And we have one flat that was donated in 2017 by a couple of associates that said, we want you to prove your model so that uh, I give you an apartment, I donate you an apartment so that uh, you can show that this project can be powerful. They are testing our model as well, and we are very happy uh, uh, about it. I'll talk in some minutes about some new projects. There are like lots of uh, discussions and assemblies about how do we calculate rent, and it's not about like 50 or 60 percent of market rates or 70 percent of market rates. Market rates are not a parameter for us. What is a parameter for us is the cost price of property. Property, this property costs something. There are the house costs, there's a fund for um, uh, wear and tear fee, uh, there's a small fund to help support the association, uh, each tenant contributes so that we can buy the next apartment so that they have the feeling that they belong to something which is larger and not just one an apartment in a lottery or something like this. Also an uh, insurance. At the end of the day, our apartment costs less than half what market price uh, would cost in an apartment. And it's no miracle. It happens to cost so few money because uh, it is uh, the financial cost of our model is zero because everybody's donating uh, money. Also something which is extremely important is transparency. When we started, people thought mm, Brazil has no uh, culture for donation. People will not uh, donate. And we, we see that consistency is something which is very important. Every month we give our monthly reports. We have yearly reports in our websites. So the money doesn't disappear. People who donate they stay with us and they understand that the money is increasing, even if it takes two or three years so that we buy a real estate, which is extremely uh, expensive. And it's really important to be consistent and transparent. And uh, uh, we see each year it gets more momentum and uh, more people are believing in us. This is the first uh, family. You don't have the time to 
talk about the selection process of the family. It's a five-person uh, family. Mariana, Eugis, Enzo, and also who are not in the picture are uh, Maisa and uh, Maria Eduarda. It's uh, really unbelievable the effect of decent housing for them. Uh, it's a functional family. Uh, they work, but they simply didn't have the income to live in a decent way, but they had every possible other requirements so that they would uh, they understood exactly what is a house about, contrary to some people that say that poor people are not uh, uh, used to live in vertical houses, they are not used to live use uh, elevators, and they are not used to... Uh, all, all sorts of prejudices about it. It doesn't have any empirical uh, sustain, sustain, uh, verification according to our family. Our family adapted from day one <laughs> to this new uh, housing. They were not adapted to the awful housing that they had before. Uh, last thing I'm talking about is that uh, it's quite interesting. We are very unique in the Brazilian landscape since we are a institution that's devoted to hold property in multiple ways, multiple properties, and use it in progressive ways. And more and more other people uh, start, uh, starting to, that's, are starting to reach us and to call us and say, we want to begin a project in this and this shape. And we are now starting a fund for agroecology. Some weeks ago, I was talking to Anna and Gerard about it. We are starting a fund, in this, in this case, an investment fund for buying tenement houses, which are overcrowded, and it's the most expensive rent in the city, although it's awful, derelict, uh, and unhealthy housing. Uh, and we are starting to have invitations from other cities to say, I want to, I want to begin a fund here in Curitiba, for example. This was a talk of this uh, week, and we are starting to build some institutional hardware so, we, so that we, as an institution that's ready, that uh, like is functional, can be a kind of incubator for other such funds. We don't want to monopolize it. We want to pro proliferate. We want to create uh, other institutions like us, but we can, in a very good uh, way, incubate it. Very often, people think if we are relevant because we have just one apartment, we are we're about to have two or three apartments, and. Uh, uh, we think we are very relevant uh, because uh, we are typifying a new kind of social actor in Brazil, which is in some countries called a social landlord, registered social landlord, or a social owner, or a housing association, or a foundation for housing, many uh, words that can be familiar for you, and in Brazil they are non-existent, so uh, it's not just about the quantity of apartments or real estate that we have, but about the quality. And everybody who is familiar with computer language will understand that the difference between zero and one, which is where we are right now, is an absolute difference. And now our society can say, well, we have a new third landscape for property rights uh, created. Mm -hmm. We also know it's a long uh, term project and we deeply hope that others can follow. And we have all our administrative solutions, our bylaws, our contracts, they are open source, everybody can copy, can get inspired about it, and we hope that in some years time we'll have some 10 or 20 of this kind of association in our country so that the state can start to look at us as reliable partners for public policies and direct subsidies for, uh, not for uh, market property, which is normally the case, almost all housing subsidies go at the end of the day for private property, either rental subsidies or uh, vouchers for buying uh, uh, houses or flats. And uh, if this money would be used in institutions that are non-profit like ours, we could really start to change our urban uh, landscape. So I'm uh, happy to talk more about you, about the, our experience. We are really happy uh, to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Renato. Um, I think we can have um, questions later, um, but now I would ask to um, David to um, come in. Yes, let me share the screen. And um, hi, everybody. Thank you. Um, I usually talk too much, and that is part of my. Afro-Caribbean, Venezuelan, 
and Russian Jew uh, otherness. So I decided to record my presentation and be in time. However, before I go click, uh, I would like to mention that we heard from uh, Professor Anna uh, the importance of the middle landscape where we acknowledge and we respect and we recognize others. And she spoke about transformations and adaptability that come from operating in this middle landscape. Um, we heard from Professor Duran of the anthropogenic uh, cities of, you know, of, uh, of the pre-capitalist cities and how we were able to, or they were able to combine agroecological approaches with the preservation of habitat and human settlements as an intertwined systems. And from Renato, we heard how uh, through, how could we uh, capture land to place it or make it uh, produce uh, social service, services. And I'm gonna try to, in my presentation, you will see that I cover the three aspects, but a, acknowledging that although we may not like the outcome of the capitalist system, 70% of the world close to it is already urbanized. One third of it is self-constructed. It's made by the people. And in less affluent countries, as we heard from Anna also, it can go all the way to 80% of the cities that we live in are made by the people. So I'm trying to combine all these things. So here we go. And then we'll have a nice debate. Hi, my I name is David Gouverneur. I'm professor of practice at the Department of Landscape Architecture and City Planning at the University of Pennsylvania. When I was national director of city planning in my homeland, Venezuela, we realized that for half of the population that lived in self-constructed settlements, the plans that we were producing made no sense. In fact, as soon as we enacted the plans, these ignited the real estate market and uh, expelled, pushed out the lower income groups from the areas we were planning for. We also understood that housing was not the problem. People can build their homes and they can expand them and improve them according to their needs. Uh, they become living machines. It's the lack of landscape or urban frameworks. We carried out plans uh, dealing with the improvement of the existing informal settlements. And if they carry it out as holistic operations, uh, they have uh, produced great results, but they're very laborious uh, since to create public space, include uh, infrastructure, uh, recreational facilities, educational facilities, we have to operate it almost in a surgical manner in these very tight uh, urban fabrics. And of course, it's pivotal to engage the community from the earliest phases in the planning, design, construction, and operations of these facilities, as we can see here in these beautiful images of uh, in Medellin, Colombia. Close to 1 billion people live around the world in existing informal settlements. And we estimate that this number will double in only two decades. This is a major challenge. The question is if it's possible to foster sustainable communities of this nature that are beginning to occupy the land, accompanying them in the different phases of transformation or evolution. Uh, to uh, answer this question, uh, I presented some ideas which I've called the informal armature approach, uh, derived from uh, professional practice, academia, uh, and it's condensed in these publications uh, in English and in Spanish, planning and design for future informal settlements. The approach suggests the use of a system of simple design components that could be adapted to different site conditions. Some corridors protect the environmental assets as streams, floodplains, rich agricultural soils. Other corridors attract the occupation towards favorable location, connecting the existing settlements with the expansion areas. They facilitate public transportation. They provide an economy of scale that can support commercial activities and other communal services. The patches provide land safe land legally cleared to facilitate the self-constructed processes. 
and also uh, for instance, let's say the patch in the center image at the lower left could be in early phases a recycling center that helps the community with materials to start to begin the construction of their homes. As the neighborhood consolidates, this recycling center could be passed to another frontier, liberating the land for other uses. The dots are the custodians. The stewards facilitate the transformation uh, of the um, components. Uh, they could be respected um, institutions, uh, NGOs, community leaders. They also serve to keep the settlement from expanding or occupying land uh, that is not adequate for urbanization. And finally, all these elements act as a network of interrelated components. Um, supporting a rich urban ecology in constant flux or transformation. The following are some of the skills that may facilitate the implementation of the approach. Political support, assemblage of public land if we wish to counteract the negative effect of real estate driven urbanism. Uh, we have to train the facilitators that understand not only the technical aspects, but that also have the ability to communicate the ideas to engage the community. And these uh, combination of interdisciplinary skills that go from the technical to the communication skills um, are not always provided by academia. We also might uh, require mechanisms to monitor the process, check uh, what's working well, what is failing, and mechanisms of transparency. Uh, we know that corruption is one of the factors that hinders progress in many developing countries. And finally, we have to adapt the approach to different site conditions, addressing the priorities. Since I'm running out of time, I would like to mention uh, only that the approach could be applied operating at very different scales from uh, territorial vision, as in the case study of the Caribbean coastline of uh, Colombia, at an urban scale, as here in the city of Cartagena, where many existing informal settlements have occupied uh, the basin, the marsh, land filling it, and destroying the mangroves. And the process is expected to uh, continue in the next 20 years with another 800,000 additional inhabitants if land is not provided, uh, as you see in the image on the right, as a framework to facilitate uh, in a plan and design matter, uh, the informal occupation. All these proposals for Ciudad de Guatemala that were developed by uh, my students at the University of Pennsylvania, working with public officials from different municipalities and local students and faculty departing from uh, metropolitan vision, focus on large districts that are currently essentially dormitory communities that have developed in a fragmented way with patches of informal settlements and gated communities, uh, eroding uh, agricultural land and uh, losing the environmental systems. And even focusing in on particular sites, for instance, this was a a fascinating location of a large public uh, land and agricultural school that segregated informal settlements from uh, middle income uh, areas in which the proposal sought to protect the uh, uh, agricultural land, the environmental corridors, establish connections mainly based on public spaces and community services between the different income communities, uh, create higher density corridors based on public transportation, defining the spatial organization, the lot allocation, and even the initial housing shell to facilitate the self-constructed processes, as well as the uh, planting material and the uh, agroforestry operations within the larger public land. I hope you, this gives you a general idea of the possibilities of this non-conventional approach and that we can uh, uh, have a very interesting uh, debate on the period of questions and answers that will follow. Thank you. Thank you. Seven minutes. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> 
So finally, let's um, see if we can have Jeda. Jeda, are you there? Você está aí, Jeda? Estou aqui. Ótimo. Você <laughs> quer começar a falar? Vou só introduzir. So Jeda is um, going to talk in Portuguese um, and I'm going to translate. I'm going to try to translate. So if, if anyone has um, problems understanding, please stop us and ask. And then we'll, um, when Jedi is done, we'll um, stop for general questions. And I think, Alice, you could um, run the, the slides for Jedi. Jedi, pode começar. Tá. É, Nyandekaru de Pameí, boa noite a todos e a todas. É, agradeço o, o convite feito pela Ana para participar aqui desse, dessa live, que ainda que seja um pouco meio complicado, porque eu não falo e não entendo inglês. É, mas eu sei falar algumas coisas em inglês. Star Wars. <risos> Como... Saying good night to everyone that she's happy to be here, that she um, excuses herself that she can't um, speak English or um, understand English, but that she knows a little few words that are not very useful now, like Star Wars. <laughs> é, enfim, e aí como a Ana já me apresentou um pouco e tal. Me chamo de Gerapotumirim, Guarani. Tem um nome em português também, mas é só um apelido. Meu nome de verdade é Gerá Guarani. Ou oh, Gerapotumirim. Meu nome artístico é Gerá Guarani. É, não entendi nada do que foi falado em inglês, mas certamente foi, foram coisas muito boas para se ouvir. Uh, e aí eu falo aqui desse território é, que é uma, é uma coisa muito importante por conta que aqui na, no território indígena Tenonde por onde eu estou e a, o território indígena da aldeia Jaraguá é, são aldeias, uma das, das únicas duas aldeias que está dentro de uma capital grande de cidade que está, no caso, aqui na capital de São Paulo. So, Jera is saying that um, her name is uh, Jera Potimirim, that her artistic name, she likes to call herself um, Jera Guarani. She is Guarani Mimbia. Um, and that she lives in the territory called Tenundepora. Um, that Tenundepora and the other Guarani um, territory in São Paulo, in Jaraguá, are the only two um, indigenous territories that are within this, a city, an urban um, environment. Um, and actually, both of them belong to the municipal São Paulo, to the district of São Paulo. Mm -hmm. É, e aí eu faço parte da equipe de liderança aqui da aldeia Tenão de Porã, em Calipetu, que é a mesma coisa. Calipetu tem sete anos de vida e o meu trabalho quanto liderança mulher, é, enfim, tive bastante é, envolvimento com a questão da mulher em si, mas esse trabalho também trouxe muitas coisas boas, está trazendo coisas boas, e uma delas foi uh, momentos como essa foto mostra, que é de mulheres lutando pela terra de direito originário, junto com os homens, junto com as crianças, junto com os jovens, com os mais velhos. Uhum. Um, Gerá é uma das jovens Guarani líderes nesse um, território, em São Paulo, And she has a very active role as a woman in the women's um, movement inside the Guarani Mimbia. And um, when they were um, fighting for the recognition of their original territory, 
um, she saw that there was a lot um, that was done by the women and um, also for the women um, fighting um, and that everyone was together, the kids, the women, the men, and everyone became important in this um, fight. Mm -hmm. uh, e aí então essa luta uh, de pela terra, pelo território, pela proteção desse território que é uma parte super importante para o planeta, né? Todas as partes verdes, todos os territórios que ainda se mantém a natureza, todos os seres diferentes também, né? Do ser humano que vive nela, como o povo guarani o meu povo respeita muito. Temos como vidas sagradas também. E aí eu estou aqui nessa aldeia Calipetã. E aí, além do, do, de ser liderança, também sou, atualmente trabalho bastante com a recuperação das sementes tradicionais do povo guarani. Jira uh -huh. is saying that this um, fight for the territory was also the fight for all the living things that live in the territory, like the forest and the animals and the trees and the rocks, which are as important as they are. Um, the, the, the Guarani Mimbia, and now um, that they have conquered um, the first step of, of the recognition, they are building their villages, and this is the village of Calipetu, that she, um, where she lives. Um, I don't know if I forgot something, Renato. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to write here as subtitles, Anna. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, enfim, e aí então acho que esse, uh, o tema dessa live e tal, né, a palavra alteridade e tal, é, é bem interessante, assim, e eu agora nesse momento eu diria que o governo brasileiro atual deveria estudar sobre o significado dessa palavra, né, é, principalmente porque esse, os, essas pessoas, esses povos diferentes é o que representa a luta maior assim, de, de, um, de um significado planetário também, que é a proteção da, das florestas e de tudo que nele vive. Uhum. Jirai is saying, um, I, I, what I forgot was that she mentioned that she um, also has a main um, function or main task to collect traditional seeds, um, which she, she is the guardian. Um, but um, what she's saying is that she thought the name of the, of the event um, based on alterity is a very um, special, uh, important name and that she wished that our government uh, in Brazil would study and try to understand what alterity means because it's not been very easy for the traditional people and they um, understand and she understands um, and she feels the importance of the traditional people not only for their own survival but as part of a huge planetary survival which I think what is what Ana Duran was also um, talking about. Mm -hmm. E então, dentro da, dessa nossa diferença, né, de sermos diferentes, mas que, de fato, o que a gente fala para os juruá, para os não indígenas, que a gente tem nossa língua materna, temos nossos costumes, mas que, de fato, somos todos seres humanos e que estamos no mesmo planeta. E aqui, para os juruá de São Paulo, a gente fala que a gente está no mesmo território, então, não somos de outro planeta. Só apenas temos culturas diferentes e que é, é humanamente mais saudável a gente respeitar o outro e as suas diferenças de pensamento, de atitude, de ação, de modo de trabalhar, de modo de viver. Uhum. Um, did I say that they um, still have their language and they still um, speak Guarani and they keep their traditions? Um, they're very linked to their traditions um, despite everything. Um, but that 
they understand and it's very clear to them that you know we're all in the same ship that we're all dividing the same territory and we're all dividing the same land um, and that although they're different um, they're not that different and we're all going to have to um, um, live in the same land and we should try to understand what is it that is different and not different and try to um, acknowledge the difference and um, try to live with it. Mm-hmm. E aí, então, a gente tem, a gente é diferente é, de vários aspectos, né? Como na nossa língua indígena, é, o qual a gente não perdeu até hoje, ainda que a gente tenha contato há mais de 500 anos com a, a língua é, do Juruá, que é o português, e além da influência, apesar da influência da cultura de Juruá na aldeia, nas aldeias Guarani, que aqui uh, no Brasil a gente tem Guarani em seis estados, muitas aldeias em seis estados, aqui em São Paulo mais de 40. E em todas essas aldeias tem escola, tem influência da, da língua de Juruá, do português, e ainda assim tem pessoas que não falam língua. Que não falam do Guarani. Ah, do branco. Que não falam é, do Juruá. Um, so, um, Jira, she, she keeps repeating the word Juruá. It's what um, Ana Calisto had, um, had explained that um, every indigenous um, people has their, their name for the non indigenous. Uh, in, in, in the Guarani case, we are the Juruá, so um, he's saying that they are very different, they have their um, religion, and that is incredible, and even to her it's incredible that after 500 years of intense um, colonization, um, there are more than 40 um, villages and 40 um, communities of Guarani in Sao Paulo, and they're um, also spread in other countries um, and in other states of, of Brazil. There are a lot um, of Guarani and in every village there is a school and there is the influence of the state. And in the school they um, force the Guaranis to speak Portuguese um, usually. And even though when you go to one of the villages and it's true, it was um, my first visit to um, Calipeti, I was incredibly surprised because it's basically in Sao Paulo. You go in and the kids, the, the, the children, they don't speak Portuguese. They only speak Guarani. Um, and if you could hear, um, if you speak um, Portuguese, you'll understand that um, Jira has an accent. Um, and some people, um, some of these Guaranis um, spread in Sao Paulo, some of them don't even speak Portuguese, which is um, in itself um, something very impressive. Uhum. E aí, além de ter toda é, essa diferença, a gente, a gente aqui da, desse território indígena que chama Tenondé Porã, estamos fazendo mais diferente ainda também. Mas, apesar de ser diferente, é algo mais voltado mais para a nossa essência mesmo. E é, é muito mais a gente mesmo, como ter uma, duas, três, quatro, cinco, seis aldeias dentro de onze aldeias que não tem mais cacique, que nesse lugar de cacique, do homem, do chefe homem que decide, que manda e que resolve, que fala, a gente tem um conselho é, guarani e algumas outras aldeias só tem mulheres na, na gestão política interna. Um, Jedi saying that um, although they have fought um, you know, and they fight for their traditions and they're very embedded in their um, own traditions, um, that in this new territory um, and the new villages that are being built in this, in this um, land, um, like the village where she lives, Kalipeti, um, that they don't have anymore the old rule of the chief. 
and they don't have the figure of the man at the top um, of the hierarchy and the command that they have instituted uh, a board like a board um, of decisions, a common group that decides for all of the villages um, and with all of the villages, what will be um, the destiny or the path um, to follow. And that in some villages, there are only women um, like in hers that are um, the political um, representative um, of the people. Mm -hmm. E esse, e esse novo modelo de gestão política interna é o que resultou é, na dispersão de mais pessoas, de duas aldeias pequenininhas, que ficaram por muito tempo pequenininhas, onde a gente perdeu muitas práticas culturais, e que agora temos 11 aldeias. E foi a modificação da, da política interna que resultou no, na, na vitória da luta pela terra, que só tinha duas aldeias pequenininhas né, nessa área que a gente está, e agora a gente tem quase 16 mil hectares de terra, onde tem 11 aldeias. E aí quatro propriamente, então, que, são, que foram iniciadas só por mulheres, onde está acontecendo muita coisa boa, assim, muito plantio, resgate, práticas culturais, os jovens reabrindo, aprendendo a plantar, a colher, a reconhecer as fases da lua, a, a construir casas e etc. Mm -hmm. So Jedi saying that before in the area where they are, there were only two very very small villages that were losing all of their strength um, and the traditions, and that after the the fight, um, after they got um, together to fight for their land that um, they conquered um, 16,000 hectares um, and that now they have um, 11, I believe, villages. Um, four of them are, um, have women as heads. And these villages are very prosperous now um, and they are regaining um, a lot of the um, things that the young people were slowly losing. Um, a lot of the young people are now planting again. They have a very diversified um, hossa, very diversified traditional um, planting. Um, the, the young people are learning to recognize the phases of the moon and to um, slowly there, um, bringing the, the, the culture to flourish again. <risos> tá. E essa, esse novo, essa nova realidade que a gente tem hoje na, no território de Tenondeponã, ele realmente é muito representativo, porque são, é, é uma área para duas comunidades que tinha quase que completamente perdido muitas coisas da, da, do espaço para fazer na prática o conhecimento da cultura tradicional, mas que, por sua vez, ficou muito vivo na memória dos mais velhos, vivo na memória e na prática das famílias que iam para outras aldeias para visitar e para ficar em aldeias maiores. E todo esse reconhecimento e o conhecimento vem se desenvolvendo de forma muito natural nesse território onde a gente está. E aí o que a gente é, quer e pede né, para o governo brasileiro e para Diruá, para os brancos e tal, é que respeitem o modo, esse modo diferente, o, o outro, como se fala, né, diferente, no sentido desse nosso princípio, que a gente vem para esse planeta, para essa vida, apenas para viver o melhor possível todos os dias, que significa ser feliz. E a essência de ser feliz, de viver feliz todos os dias, é você ter o suficiente. E aí, então, a gente não é um povo, não somos comunidades, não são aldeias que vai lutar pelo progresso do país, por exemplo. Não temos permissão para fazer monocultura, não temos permissão para devastar a natureza e 
fazer plantações para o comércio, comércio, por exemplo. A gente planta, planta só para comer, para compartilhar, para sustentar, alimentar o nosso corpo e nosso espírito. Uhum. So she's saying that um, part of the success of um, bringing the traditions to this new territory was the exchange with the elders, um, that they were able to keep a lot of the traditions that the young people were losing, and also um, the constant kind of switching and visiting between villages um, also helped um, when they had the territory granted then all of this knowledge could come back and it quickly came back. Um, what she asks is that the government and that us, the Juruá, that they accept a different way of seeing things. And this way of seeing things, things um, is about coming to the planet, coming to life to just live a good life. And that everyone can live every day a good life. And living a good life um, is having the sufficient um, stuff you need to survive and to be happy. And that they, that they are not going to fight for the progress of the country. They're not going to fight for the progress of anything. They're not going to um, accept. She says, we are not allowed to do monoculture. We are not allowed to do commercial agriculture. We are not allowed to do any um, commercial or do anything that is going to um, trade for only money. Um, that's not what they're allowed to do and that's not what they're going to do. Quanto tempo ainda tem, Ana? Eu acho que você pode parar se você quiser, <laughs> mas... É, tá. também. Você quer falar um pouco só das <risos> espécies que você já plantou? Sim, é, então eu ia falar um pouquinho disso, assim, da, da, da realidade feliz que a gente está vivendo, né? Que por mais de 60 anos, as duas aldeias ficaram é, plantando, assim, é, cada vez mais em... em, em, em em quantidade pequena, por conta da falta da terra, só o milho de branco, só o milho é, padronizado, esse amarelinho, e que até meus 22 anos, agora eu tenho quase 40, e até os meus 22 anos não, não tinha nunca nem visto esses milhos guarani com essas cores diferentes, preto, branco, amarelo, mesclado, enfim, e que... É, Guarani, depois os, as comunidades, as famílias Guarani aqui desse território, depois de ter a terra é, maior, demarcado, em seis anos a gente conseguiu recuperar mais de nove tipos de milho e mais de 50 tipos de batata doce, e que já compartilhamos com muitas aldeias, muitos agricultores orgânicos de Uruá também. Uhum. Uhum. Um, Jada wants to finish her talk and she wants to finish on a happy note. Um, there she, she understands that they're living a very prosperous and happy time of their lives, that they were able to conquer this land before they didn't have any room um, or space to plant um, their own plants. And until she was 22, she had never even seen um, the traditional Guarani corn. They would only plant the seeds that the Juruá, the white people used to plant. So the, the, the white corn or the yellow corn. And now she was able um, by um, going to different um, Guarani communities, she was able to collect and she has nine varieties of corn, traditional Guarani corns that you can see in this, in this um, picture. And she also has more than 50, I thought it was um, 20, but she has more than 50 different types of Guarani sweet potato that they're planting. Um, and I think, um, Jeda, você acabou? Acho que sim, tá bom. <laughs> this is, um, the, the end of, of Jada's um, talk. Thank and I would so. like to invite um, everyone to, if, you know, there's some questions, I think um, in the chat, um, if, if you wanna um, turn your 
mic on and you want to ask it yourself, please um, feel free to do that. I think Kat has a question in the chat. If you want to ask Kat. Sure. Um, by Aisha Pajela. So I have a question Hola. for you. <laughs> mm. So I was curious if you could speak about um, whether there is resistance taking place against the expanding industrial soy, soy farming in Brazil, because it was going on a lot in Paraguay. So I was curious what that means for the future of your village. And um, I wish in Debe. Good job. Um, a Kat está perguntando se no Brasil ou se vocês têm algum tipo uh, de movimento de resistência à soja que está sendo plantada e que ela está vendo que no Paraguai está fazendo muito, muitos danos, né? É, e, e ela queria saber se essa é uma realidade que vocês têm também. Hum. Sim, eu acho que no Brasil essa, essa situação está é, mais uh, no, mundo do, no mundo, no território, na vida dos Guarani Caioá, no Mato Grosso do Sul. Uhum. Que as plantações de soja, de milho, de cana-de-açúcar invadem o território indígena e acontecem atrocidades, como assassinato... Uh, com muita liberdade assim, dos fazendeiros, dos mandantes de fazendeiros e o governo simplesmente fecha os olhos para essa questão. Mm -hmm. um, what Jara said is that um, in, in, in their territory there is not that problem. I don't know if it was um, easy to see there was a map, but um, Tenondepura is very close to, São Paulo, to the downtown São Paulo. It's within the, the city, the districts um, of the city of São Paulo. So there is not too much, I mean, there's a lot of urban pressure, but not the pressure of the soy. Um, that is a problem that the uh, Guarani who live in central Brazil, the Guarani uh, Caiova, mm -hmm. are, 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 are they have a lot of problem and they are in a very, very um, fragile and dangerous situation and they're being murdered um, every day um, with very ease, a lot of ease. Um, the government is not doing anything um, and it's actually protecting the big um, landowners. So yes, it's, it's, a, it's a very sad and, and, and big problem. Any more questions? I'm going to put everyone on my screen. Um, and you would translate for Gerard? Mm -hmm. uh, fala português, no? Oi, Gerard, vou tentar falar português. Bueno. I'll translate to the English. In the chat. Parabéns, essa apresentação magnífica. É, você falou que Vocês não estão interessados em, em transformar o Brasil, que estão se ocupando da, da sua comunidade. Mas eu acho que o, os aportes de, desse esforço que vocês estão fazendo vá muito mais longe que a sua comunidade. Porque a preservação da a modo da vida, da cultura, tudo que você explicou com tanto detalhe e claridade, também é a preservação de uma atitude de preservação da natureza, de um exemplo uhum. ver com a natureza. É, em, em, em meu livro eu falo de stewards, de guardiães, de custódios, que custodiam com amor a natureza. Então, o impacto uhum. de vocês vai muito mais longe que a comunidade guarani. É muito mais uhum. 
Son esas dos cosas simultáneamente, para la comunidad y para, para el planeta en general, como falou Ana. Uh -huh. Parabéns. Gracias. Oye, vete. Es verdad. <laughs> Ana, can you translate that for the audience? Uh, your, your microphone Oi? is out. Ana, your microphone is out. Um, Sorry, um, I think Alicia has translated in the chat, but I'll, I'll try to translate it um, also. Um, what Davi is saying is that Jeda, um, he, first he congratulated Jeda for her presentation and for her beautiful um, talk, um, that she's saying that the Guarani are not interested in, um, you know, making Brazil, you know, advance or, you know, the progress of, of, of the Brazilian state. But what he believes is that they are the guardians of something um, that is very important and that goes beyond their own community um, and affects um, the whole country um, because they are the example and the guardians of um, our um, another way of treating or living um, with nature. Am I translating it right, Davi? Or maybe you want to translate it? <laughs> Habitat conservation, water conservation, the biodiversity conservation, medicine, beyond the cultural practices, all that is embedded in their territories. Mm -hmm. And you know, and if I was a politician in Brazil, or I was part of all the groups, I would say, this is why it's so important to support us and to protect us and to leave us operate in the way that we know how to operate because it's, in ben it's beneficial for a much broader uh, society and for the planet. Yeah. But that, that's a very good point because this in Brazil, the, the right wing and you know, the people who are not only the right wing, but the people who, whose discourse is to exploit the territory where the Indians are, this, what you are saying is um, justified as the foreigner you know, speech. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, you know, everything belongs to us and we're Brazilians and we have to decide. And it's a it's a big cynicism because at the end, um, you know, the the forests and the soil they are exploited by global industry and um, Brazilians, you know, they we don't we don't keep a lot, a lot of it. <laughs> yes, but if the convention would be to pay, that the world community would pay for the preservation of this because it means, as Anna says, it's our, it's our water, it's our air, it's our biodiversity. Eventually, I see that conventions are gonna start paying for the preservation of these communities and these lands for the benefit of the planet. That, that I hope we see this in this generation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is something that I think uh, maybe Anna um, Maria knows more about that, but there are several conventions and several um, talks about that, right? Um, there's, um, I think there was a very important um, benchmark um, in the 80s and then in the 90s um, to also um, give the property rights um, to traditional met methods and medicines, like you said, um, which um, I think was was uh, was very important, but I don't know. Um, maybe Anna knows more. I don't think that um, you know we're being they're being compensated by anything, and especially with this government, um, the Yanomami are under extreme attack now. Um, it was um, one of the people that um, in Brazil were still somewhat preserved. Um, they were with very very rich, interesting. Um, cultural traits and, and, and life, um, and, and also a very, very strong political presence um, with Davi Kopenawa. Um, and now they're being you know, targeted since um, the campaign for presidency, Bolsonaro has targeted them. And it's not by accident, you know, they, they are um, above a huge um, mine of, of gold. Um, so it's, um, it's all about it's all about the soil and, and what's under the soil right now. The one interesting thing I think is that um, the, 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 the distortion is so cruel um, and it's so barbarian now with, with, the, with the, the politicians that we have and the government that we have that the private sector has stepped up. 
um, and bankers, um, the, the three biggest banks in Brazil have um, pledged and written in July and June um, to form a board and they have formed a board to, um, to draft policies, private policies to protect um, the Amazon. So it's, it's so crazy that now we have, um, you know, <laughs> which I think is a good thing right now, but um, it, it, it's, it's how it's um, working. I mean, these are very complex issues, but I share your frustration, Anna, which I guess is also Gerard, her people's frustration in the sense that like right now in, in the scientific panel for the Amazon that was assembled with 200 people who are writing about 20 chapters on the current state of Amazonia. And uh, I went through the, through the 200 names and not a single one is a, I don't wanna use the word indigenous, but I never know what to use instead of it. A, not a single one belongs to one of the original peoples of the Americas. And that is extremely shocking to me. Like, I think that we are still incredibly intolerant of alterity and capitalism as a system is extremely intolerant of anything that does not look to itself. It refuses to understand the logic of any other. And there is, you know, communal property in the center of, of the debate because we're not, and I'm not, you know, talking about doing away with private property or doing away with public property, but with the ability to coexist as the, as the new Biennale states, you know, private property and public property can coexist with communal property and with all things communal. Uh, why not? Why, why does the communal have to be extirpated? I mean, what Gerard has shown today is mind boggling because, you know, you see the same pattern in Amazonia, wherever there's healthy forest, there's a commune. Wherever there's a damaged, striated forest, there's privatization. And uh, in Amazonia, it's clear, privatization causally correlates with deforestation. There's no doubt. And the communal ownership of land, which correlates generally with quote unquote indigenous communes, a, there's, there's a healthy environment. And you see that in the middle of Sao Paulo, I mean, this is mind boggling, what Gerard <laughs> showed. It's incredible. But Anna, I'm glad that you presented it that way uh, because you're dealing with, the, I think that what is not healthy is when we speak in terms of opposites, where we say, well, we have to tear down the capitalist system because it's not working. That doesn't conduct to dialogue. But when you present it in a way of coexistence of the different forms of habitat, of culture, of economy, and you find to, a way to build bridges and that's what I'm extremely interested on. So I think that it's, I mean, it, what I'm sure, I can assure you that in most of these articles that are written, it is a problem of denunciar, of denounce what's not working. The system is not working, capitalist evil, this is the result, but it's more difficult to build the bridges and the intermediate solutions of tolerance and coexistence. And I think that's some, one of our role of professor of, 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 of students that are interested in, in habitat and in design is to build the bridges. So I'm very glad that you framed that way at the end. And the other thing that is that we always, I mean, when, when you talk, talked about the practices in, you know, in Mesoamerica, in the Amazon, where you were able to have agroforestry, where you were able to have habitat preservation and you have the communities, obviously we're dealing with a scale that is very different of what we have now in these mega cities. The question is how we extract the logic, the ethics of that thought, and we can adapt them to some things that are very different scale. And that is, you know, that is so, so when, when people hear our discourse and say, this is true what we've done in the research, they say, yeah, but that is something of the past. That is a very small scale that doesn't respond to a city of 20 million people that's gonna have 40 million people. But I think that our role is to make the connection. I think, it, David, that you're sort of doing it already in the sense that this is, you mentioned the word multi-scalar in your presentation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a critical word because you see these principles of design from the scale of a small village in Amazonia all the way to a 350,000 people 
city, if you want to use that word, in I, let's say urban agroecology in the in the Xingu. So okay. it's, I think that principles have that amazing quality of being multi-scalar, and I think that what you are doing in terms of this reinsertion of natu- of you know of ecological systems that are also agroecological in the cities, as you you know your images. While I was looking at your images, I was thinking, interesting, the indigenous principles coming back into the cities. Because, you know, it's like all the tradition of landscape architecture uh, in the US stems from Ian McCarg in a way. You know, the one that is propelling, talk about you, Penn, he was there. The one that is propelling the notion of urban ecology, ecological urbanism, oh, landscape I mean, urbanism. communities did it 2,000 years before him. Exactly, and Ian McCarr clearly states in his book that he was greatly inspired by Native America because he said in this animistic culture, what I see is a relationship with nature that is talk, an anotherness. You know, it's a different relationship with nature. And this is what America has given me because he was Scottish. So he comes from that Western ontology of the city, yet he had the eye to penetrate it, like Michael Sorkin, you know, his proposals are at a whack. It's about this idea of intertwining again, you know, breaking down dualisms and binaries that have marked us for so long. And go back to intertwining agroecological ideas with habitat, with city. That's doable in a city of 20 million, 40 million. Because again, it's about multi-scalar principles. They can be applied to a little Quechua settlement in the Napo, or they can be a, applied to a large settlement in the Singu, or they can be applied to the 70% informal mantle of Caracas or, or Guayaquil. It's about the principles. And I think we need to go back to those principles and even to go even further, because as I was listening to, to this amazing uh, intervention of you know, how the Guarani live in, in, in Sao Paulo, when I think Quito from that perspective, Quito has at least 72 Quitucara or Quichua communes within the conurbation. Each one of those communes is an amazing ecology, just like the one we saw in Sao Paulo. If you started urban planning in Quito, and since you're gonna be working there, David, my suggestion would be get those communes mapped because they already provide an ecological framework for the city and they're ancestral. They have provided this ecological framework for 2000 years, at least. And then at the corridors that interconnect at the Capagnang and at the, you know, at the new corridors, at the modern framework, at the law of Indies, the whole hybridization. But underneath that, you know, there's this amazing structuring of the, of the territory that is Kitukara, that is pre-Inca, Inca, and now, you know, the communes are there and they're facing exactly the same problems that the Guarani face. They're being murdered, they're being imprisoned, they're being persecuted because their lands are worth millions. So I'm, I'm wondering, you know, maybe this indigenous planning that is also contemporary and multi-scalar may also be the clue to the future coexistence of alterity within our cities. Because we have literally squeezed them out with our ontology that has no tolerance for that alterity, that doesn't think in terms of agroecology within the city. It's like, what do you mean agroecology in the city? Are you crazy? So I think that, and, and then the thing that interests me about what Renato it talked about, and I have been looking a lot about, at the history of, of communal property in Latin America. And the Hispanic America has a very different history from the Brazilian America. And I'm really intrigued by that difference. And one thing that Brazil does not have that I think that the Andes should donate to the indigenous movement in Brazil is that concept of communal property. Of course, the state always finds a way of extirpating it. Yeah, it's your communal land. Whatever, you know, Mr. Schwar, Mrs. Schwar or Achuar or Kofan or what have you, but the subsoil belongs to the state, that's public. You know, so the surface is yours and whatever's on it, but because the subsoil belongs to the state, we also have issues because 
you have the communal law that defends communal property and it comes all the way from an the ancestral America through the laws of Indies. And it has been reshaped very many times until today. And the government always finds a way of introducing loopholes to be able to appropri appropriate and exploit communal lands. I, and you know, but there's something there. To me, there's something in this figure, in this land tenure figure of the communal property that for example, in Quito has, has allowed some of these communes to survive in the midst of incredible and very aggressive urban extractivism, if you wish. Where the Quitucara tell me, you know, for us, the real estate development is like for the Quichua down there in the Amazon, the oil, there's no difference. And the threat is the same and the violence is identical. And the, and the good thing about having a law is that for example, communal property cannot be subdivided. So it's not, you know, the private, the private logic is, which is all about plotting and subdividing into small pieces that it can sell out is not interested in having a land that is defined as communal property because it's indivisible, for example. So there can be legal aspects that I think that we need to pick and choose and learn from and see how we, we insist on, 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 those, on those alterities that are being completely suffocated within the city and in the countrysides and in the hinterlands of South America and Brazil. Or, or, I mean, of Hispanic America and, and Portuguese America and Brazil, because I don't know, I just feel that there's something there talk about resistance that we really need to defend because public property is going nowhere, but the state is always willing to give concessions out. So pro public property doesn't protect the land and private property is also there, but it's not going to necessarily protect the land. Sometimes it does. Sometimes people buy land to preserve it or conserve it. Yeah, maybe Renato wants to uh, respond or comment on that. Yeah. Yeah, while Anna can answer the question mm -hmm about the author in the chat? I think uh, what we are doing is not communal property. We are kind of hacking, as I wrote, hacking our private property system so that we can talk about like mission-driven property or something like this. Uh, we, can, we think we can go quite far with this kind of property, but it's not communal property. It's really a different concept in Brazil. Uh, we have the concept of communal property in different fashions. In the more traditional one, for example, in South Brazil, there is a tool called, uh, <clears throat> there's a figure called Fascinal, which is kind of communal property. And then after the 1988 constitution, we have, uh, uh, we have uh, Quilombola property, uh, which is uh, when, uh, Black communities that are remains remains from uh, uh, they have traditional property which were the Quilombos, which were black communities that either escaped escaped from uh, the farms or had some kind of organization which was very peripheral because nobody was interested in this land. They don't have land deeds, but they live in the same land uh, forever. Uh, and uh, for this, we cannot say that this is public property, but it's neither private property because they don't have land deeds. And since 1988, we have the figure of uh, the Quilombola property. And it's also, it's there, each Quilombo is kind of a FICA because they have to make a nonprofit association that will get the land under their name. And, uh, but once you get the land registered as Quilombola, Quilombola property, it behaves like communal property in a way that our land, FICA's land, cannot behave because it's simply non-profit property. So it's more radical. So I think we we have uh, we have uh, uh, been interpreting this kind of concept of communal property in Brazil, and we have some uh, responses. But I wanted to talk something about. I was deeply identified when Gerato, and I think this is when we can really be post-colonial when she was talking about I am happy I'm planting now I know now I'm planting nine species of corn which I not even knew when I was 20 years old and now I'm happy and I felt 
a little bit an Indian in my small village, which is one or maybe two or three flats in which I'm planting kind of my kind of corn in this sense and being happy about it. So that this is this kind of resistance that it's really not about um, uh, denouncing or or um, uh, having this broad picture, which is always very negative, but defining our small universes in which we can set up some of the rules and be happy through them. I think when we are doing these, we are, I think we are we are planting authority. You know, we are in. This is not the privilege of uh, indigenous people. We Western people can learn how to do it as well. This is I, I believe deeply in this. Yeah, I think we uh, we have a question in the chat. I think maybe Gabriel wants to ask. He has the video on. Um, I think part of it was, was already answered, but um, I've seen some of the effect of David's work in, in Quito as well. And I was wondering, because in doing territorial design work, it, in, in Latin America, it's very difficult sometimes to translate um, the pictures that Jada shows and the desire for modernity has, has been said many times in this lecture. And I was wondering how, how successful the translation, the translations, because um, with David's drawings, I mean, they're drawings that could be applied to, uh, in, at least in their, in their drawing language to many different types of projects. I think it's it's really interesting to see and read um, very traditional ways of 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 using the habitat of of living basically through in a, in a very formal language. And I think that we as architects, I, I think many of the most of us are architects. Um, we can respond to those drawings from our training almost. And um, and and I know that in planning, when you present that type of drawing, it's much more accepted than if you draw, present hand drawings or hand sketches that are just as valuable from communities or if you present photographs. And so I was wondering if that has been a, a useful strategy, um, David, with you, your work and your students' work when, when you present in, in the municipios um, in Caracas and other places. Yeah, so what, what we discovered is that, f first of all, it's, uh, you know, let me backtrack in a, in, a, in a framework. And this is a discussion we had with Professor Anna when she invited me to this, is that your generation is a generation that you are advocates. I mean, all of you that are going to school now and you're graduating in the years that you will practice, you have an agenda of advocacy, fighting for uh, social justice, inclusion, um, environmental uh, stability, these uh, in climate change. I mean, all these things that were not in the agenda when I went to school 30 years ago, you live with it. You know, you can't even breathe without thinking about this. And sometimes I feel that, mm, but many people are doing this. The politicians are doing this. The Green New Deal is doing this. Uh, um, anthropologists are doing this. Uh, journalists doing this. And sometimes I feel that we lose a big, the contributions that we can provide a, through design, through and design in the broader sense, multi-territorial, multi-scalar design that brings in so many different components that really can make a difference by creating added value. And it's going from the advocacy from the words to something that really is there to, to action. So that's one thing I would like to underline. Design super matters. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's, it's not something that you can neglect. And what we've seen is that when we present this type of drawings and we map them over a territory where people can recognize the tree, their home, whatever, their city, that it's not an abstract diagram or an idea, but they can see it. They can see it in the plan and they can see it in the 3D rendering and we do a before and a the, an after. People say, hmm, well, that seems rather interesting and it's something that we could relate to. So the graphic and the image is very powerful 
to be able to have a dialogue with the communities and with the politicians and even with the private sector to see if we're speaking about the same thing. And then they come in and say, well, why don't you change this? This doesn't seem to be right. This is not the planting. Uh, you said that uh, th that's not really the place where it really floods, it's lower down. You know, or, or you, know, that you, you didn't take into consideration that there's a property that somebody wants to sell and, and, and this farm owner has a good heart and the other one is really an asshole. So, so it, it's a mechanism to really go into the dialogue. Yeah, I think you're, you're... I think that's super important because it's, it goes to what you're saying about bridging and not confronting. And I think that that work of translation of getting the conversation to where the two actors that many times are at opposite sides of the table and really are, are just itching for a fight can start to speak about the neighbor, as you say, or the, 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 that you start to speak a common language and you start to kind of, or which is a com somewhat different because somebody's done the work of translation. I think it's it's been... In my experience, and I admire much, a lot of what you guys, of what you do, um, of finding those different ways of applying strategies that seem so different, but that can be applied over in the same in the same context. You know, sometimes one technique that we do, and I invite you to explore it, is when we become these processes, we do charrettes on the ground, and we try to bring as many people in from the community the developer, the ecologist, the green freak, you know, the, the transportation people, the legal guy, you know, the, the producer of whatever. So of many different actors, even if we don't like them, and we ask them to start mapping what they would kill for, what they're aiming for, what they would see like to see happening in their territory. And of course, the, the communities and the conservationists are gonna map certain things. And then we're gonna see where it overlaps with the guy that wants to build a shopping mall on top of it. And there we have a problem. But we start to understand why, why, what is the logic of this shopping mall and where it could go. And then we start negotiating. So it's in, in that direction of what you. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. But, but David, one thing that we do have to be careful with right now is that the balance is very, 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 very strong in terms of just turning off all voices that are not the dominant voice. And I feel that if we're going to play the role of bridges, we really need to have megaphones because it's amazing how deaf the system can be towards indigenous voices. And that is absolutely exasperating. I've heard so many scientists in the scientific panel for the Amazon say, we need to make the people in the Amazon understand that. And I'm like, you need to learn from the people in the Amazon. Let's begin by that. Let's humble up a little bit and not go and tell anyone how they should live. And maybe we really need to have like an ontological, it's just like deaf ears and blind eyes. You know, the West never saw a culture in Amazonia. It always saw Amaranya. Oh, From day great. one, I've been reading the chronicles written by the Spaniards as much as I've been reading the documents written by, by the elites that, that, that learned the alphabet very early on in the 16th century. And it's crazy just the, the difference when, when, when you have this expedition that goes down uh, the Ucayali, not the first one by Orizana, but the second one, the, the Ursua one. And they were obviously going after this, I guess they imagined the monoculture of cinnamon. Mm -hmm. And when they get there, there's a polyculture that for them is just this like wild, insane maraña, you know? They never saw, they, their eyes were not trained to see agriculture in Amazonia. Their eyes were not trained to see, well, they saw the cities very well and they described them very well and they do describe them as cities, which is shocking because now people want to use the word cities when they discuss Amazonia, con pinzas because it doesn't fit the naturalistic perspective of Amazonia, which we inherited from the illustrate, you know, from the la Ilustración, the Who English, the Enlightenment, and, and then the Romantic movement. So, but the, but the Spaniards had no qualm about describing the ginormous cities that they found in the Amazon because they needed labor. So yeah. they had to, you know, they were into resources and that included human resources. So they wanted to make sure that the monarchy knew that there were lots of potential slaves in the Amazon. So I feel that there is this deafness and blindness to the West who feels it has the scientific, and I have nothing against science, but I believe in the hybrid. That's another word you use, David. Yes, thank it's you. It's like scientific authority 
to tell everyone else what progress is, how it looks like, and how you achieve it. I'm writing that your same words can apply to the biases against a self-constructed city. Exactly. You know, our, our, our pedagogues, our planning refer to the informal students. You can imagine, I'm dealing with students now working simultaneously with the Universidad de Guadalajara, and we discovered that in the zoning code of a city like Guadalajara, which is like, you know, the second in population in Mexico, they refer to the informal city as marginados. Degrees of marginacion, marginacis, marginization. It's insane. And of course, that mental framework passes to the students. This is something evil that we have to eradicate. So we're talking exactly the same thing. It's the biases and, you know, and just erasing the others from the scenario. Unless they become like you, you know, that's the implication. And education co is, plays a role in that, as, as it was noted tonight. Education has been a colonial pursuit and the indigenous movements clearly have stated that they will fight for communal property, that they will fight for the multi-ethnic and multicultural state, Estado Pluricultural, no? For the bilingual education. I mean, the indigenous movement and the Summa Causa, it's everywhere. They have a very clear political agenda, but the intolerance towards it is crazy. Capitalism doesn't like communal property. It's not into coexistence. The state hates it will find ways of squeezing it out of existence. So I feel that, you know, in that sense, resistance also goes through our need to really understand a different ontology, which is amazing and has so many clues for the future. But if we keep on destroying it, destroying its languages, its expressions, its architectural expressions, urban expressions, landscape expressions, I don't know, I, I, see, I see it even among scientists, to be honest with you. The, the scientific panel for the Amazon has been one of the most frustrating experiences I've had in my life. And I was very happy when I was invited to participate. And at this point, I'm like, I don't know. I, it just feels like one more, you know, it's like, oh, capitalism is going to save Amazonia from capitalism. Sorry, I'm very skeptic. And I, I'm not a millennial, but I'm very skeptic. <laughs> I don't think capitalism will save Amazonia from capitalism. But, um, Maybe um, the proliferation of the commune, you know, but it's like this whole discussion that is all about like, oh, let's let's come into carbon trade so that we can save Amazonia. But then they tell the communes in the Amazon, we'll give you money to conserve the forest, but you can't touch it because there's this romantic idea. And the indigenous communes say, no, there's no there's no chance we're going to sign up for this because we extract the forest. We've been doing it forever and it's actually highly anthropogenic. Well, so how are you going to tell us not to touch it? Because now we have to take the burden of climate change generated in your geographies. It's really frustrating. It is very frustrating. The view from Amazonia is probably the most frustrating view in the world. But anyway, I'm going to shut my mouth. But Anna, just, um, I think we need to wrap up, but I think of all of this, you know, and, and to end on a, on a positive note, I think you know, this wave that we're living and we have in our lifetimes, I, I'm older than you are, but you know, we've coming from third world countries or well, however you call them, um, we have lived through, you know, different ups and downs. Um, this is not the first one um, and, it will, and it will pass. And I think um, there is something that I noticed um, in Brazil at least, and it was very noticeable in, in a very kind of um, empirical way um, is that there was a big reaction and it was not a big reaction from the science or the scientific panels. It was a reaction of people, you know, suddenly saying, we don't, we don't want the Amazon to be destroyed. We don't want the indigenous people to be destroyed. You know, there is a government, there is a certain kind of um, frame of thought but the average person in Brazil, and I think the, the accept like this opinion is like 76% of the population. They say no, no. And it became a very strong topic. So um, I think we will destroy before we rebuild, but I think there is a strong movement and I believe um, in what um, you know, Renato is saying 
and, and what Dilip, um, you know, says, we have to also start, you know, like you're saying, believing in different systems that don't rely on flows. They rely on drops, like the rain. And if you have enough drops, <laughs> you know, it will, it will revert, reverse something. Um, and and I, I think, you know, it just, we, we take time to do things, you know, we're dumb in a way, right? It, it takes time for humanity to do things. But I think we're, you know, we're, you know, this wave is gonna pass and we're gonna do it. There's so many people that I know that are now going out of, especially with the pandemic, they're just going and, and they said, I'm gonna go to my, to my family's farm and I'm gonna plant and they're gone. You know, it's a minority, but I think it's the same example of Fika. It's, it's, it's radical in its proposition. It's a seed. And forests grow faster than we imagine. I mean, the forest, the forest can come back. Yeah. We do have hope. Yeah, the, the forest in Calipeti, in Tenon de Apora, um, you know, it, it, it was, it's something that has five years and the techniques that, you know, Gosh is doing in Brazil with the eucalyptus, the, in Calipeti means eucalyptus. They had planted eucalyptus all over part of the territory of the Guarani. And, and, and then um, Guarani reached out to Gosh, um, this, this German guy who lives in Brazil and, and has this re agro reforestation uh, method that uses the eucalyptus because it grows so fast as the first phase of the feeding of the soil. And they are, they, in, three, in five years, they've, you know, they don't have the you know, uh, like rain, you know, like this maturing forest, but they have, um, you know, something equal to like a third generation already um and 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 it's it's beautiful yeah i think on this note we gotta wrap up the conversation yes <laughs> yes <laughs> because i think we can go till midnight or forever oh, yeah. i would like to thank everyone for coming and i think the conversation has been great very enlightening and i think i, I would like to thank the panelists too for sharing the perspectives the research and I think this wraps up our, the whole conversation series of the semester on the high note. So thank you everyone for coming.